little different. And listening to the talks today, I, I was thinking, maybe I've miscalculated, but we'll see. Um, what we've been talking about all day long is the fundamentals. Is there a God, that sort of thing. And I'm going to be talking about something a bit removed from that, a new social is issue that we need to worry about. And that is, okay, there's, there's this movement of atheists. And I think most of us here are probably in that movement. Okay. Yes, all right. Okay, if, 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 if I were talking to a room full of Christians, they would just be totally baffled about what I'm going to talk about next. But, okay, we're on track. Uh, what I want to talk about now is this new backlash that's arising. And I want to talk about a couple of arguments that people are making that basically say the atheist movement is futile. We're going to fade out pretty soon and go away. Which we're not, all right? But I want to talk about uh, a little bit of uh, a few of their arguments and, and sort of shoot them down and have some fun talking about biology as well because if you know me, you know whatever I talk about, I turn it into this extended metaphor from biology. So be prepared. Okay, first thing is, uh, what does it mean to be an atheist? And I think we all know that the basic one here is, is there, uh, there are no gods. And I think we're all on the same page with this one. This is the defining thing about atheists. But however, there are some other properties that are emerging in the atheist movement now. And uh, these are, for instance, this one. Uh, many atheists are not just passive about it. They're just saying, well, there's no God. They're actively anti-religious. I'm one, anyone out there? Okay, we've got a few of you, good, okay. But let's be fair, there are atheists who don't feel that way. So we've got a range of, of, of views here. There are some atheists who think it's just fine to get along with, with other religions, and, and some of us are ready to go tear the churches down. Uh, here's another one. This is a fairly new one. I've, I've done some reading in the history of atheism and secularism and so forth. And in this country, this, these weren't so tightly tied together, but in this new atheist movement, uh, it, it's largely a scientific movement. You know, we've got Vic Stinger here, uh, you think of Richard Dawkins, uh, maybe even me, lots of people like us, we're out there because we're scientists. We're saying, hey, look, science works, science doesn't need God, there's a lot of evidence out there that says that God doesn't exist. And we're also going further, we're saying that what you ought to be doing in your life is you ought to be living to a scientific ideal, which is you should be rational, you should base your decisions on evidence, you should be skeptical. All these things that are the hallmark of a good scientist, I think are also the hallmark of a good atheist. We also say this one, we can be good. So there's the moral argument. And we can do that without gods, without dogmas, without rituals, and without sacraments. But again, you will find some atheists who waffle a little bit on this one. Uh, they're willing to say, yeah, you can be good without gods. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention Epstein right now, who's got this new book, Good Without God, uh, which is making that point. But Epstein, for instance, thinks rituals and things like that are wonderful things, and people should be free to indulge in them. So we've got a range of values again there. Uh, one that's somewhat contentious is that a lot of us now are saying we can be good without gods and so can you. There's a little bit of an evangelical component arising in our atheism now. Look at Richard Dawkins' uh, out campaign. Uh, look at what JT was just saying up here. He's saying we're, we're all saying that there's some responsibility to communicate these ideas to the public at large and get the message out there. Okay, so we're getting pretty active. And you hear this all the time in the newspaper, people talking about these new atheists and, and how they're being rambunctious and, and doing militant things like writing books, you know, and horrible stuff like writing blogs and oh man, you know, next thing it's gonna be raining cats and dogs and whatever, right, anyway. So what's happening now is we're getting a little bit of a reaction that people are giving us reasons that atheists <laughs> are not just doomed, but doomed, right? We are doomed, we're not gonna make it. Uh, the three reasons I'm seeing a lot of right now 
are people are pointing out schisms. They're saying, oh, there are these deep rifts in the atheist communities. They're all fighting among each other, which we've seen here today with all of you atheists just clawing it. No, well, whatever. After, after we're loosened up with a beer, then, then the brawls begin, right? <laughs> Another common argument is this second one. Uh, atheists aren't having babies, and we will be dying out. You've heard of the quiverful mutant, uh, movement? Yeah, these are, these are religious communities where they say a woman's responsibility is to pump out as many babies as she can, be quiverful, and they're having 10, 12, 15 babies. And yes, we can't compete against them. We don't want to compete against them. <laughs> but they're saying, oh, and this is where they get all pseudoscientific, and they say, oh, well, look at these population rates and all this stuff, and they're, they're, we're going to destroy them. Uh, we're going to bury the atheists in our babies pretty soon. <laughs> and the last one is, is a very common one uh, where people will assert that religion is a human universal. And they'll usually go a little bit further than that, and there's some nasty implications here where a real human believes in God. What does that make us? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going for X-Men right, right now myself. Yeah. We're, we're mutants of some sort. So let me just go through each of these arguments one by one. And I'll, I'll tell you why I disagree with them. And like I said, there's going there's to be, it's, I can't help it. Biology creeps in. Okay, so this first one, uh, these deep rifts that are appearing in the uh, atheist community. Uh, I'll show you a couple of examples of people writing about this. Oh, got to aim over there. Wall of text, yes. Uh, I don't have a pointer, do I? Well, yeah, it's, it's, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. Uh, but this is from a, a columnist in Australia who's, who's very upset because of the atheist convention coming in March, which I'm going to, and who else is going to the big atheist con convention in Australia? No. It's going to be a hoot. <laughs> really good stuff. Anyway, uh, they're, they're kind of upset about there. There's a bunch of people complaining because all these atheists are descending on the continent, and a lot of the Australians are saying, but what? We're, we're already atheists. Anyway, uh, so she's very upset, and uh, she starts ranting and raving in here about atheism rent by disagreement, proving that the need for petty internecine squabbling runs deeper in the psyche than the need to find meaning in existence. And she points out that the question is, you know, leading proponents arguing about tactics. Some are saying, we should be more conciliatory. We should get along more with religious people. We should work with them more. And others are saying, no, we, sh we should laugh at them harder, and all this other kind of stuff. So anyway, there's these arguments going on. And, and she sees this as a sign of our imminent destruction. We're going to have a civil war, and we're going to die out. Uh, another one is, is this fellow, Michael Roos, who's a philosopher in Florida. And I've got to be honest, uh, a, a lot of evolutionary biologists don't like Michael Roos. Okay, Michael Roos has done some good work for science in the past, but right now he's regarded as sort of a Benedict Arnold, who's happily helping out creationists. And, and here he is, he's complaining about Dawkins, and he's talking about schisms. There's a, certainly a split, a schism in our ranks. So he's, he's saying the same thing, that we're falling apart. Of course, in this case, it's because nobody likes Michael Roos. So the schism is between Michael Roos and everyone else. So it's, it's not a very deep one. I think there's a shallow schism way off on the one side. So anyway, they're, they're complaining. What are they complaining about? Well, here's, here's the issue that came up. Um, you know, a little while ago, is Dan Barker here yet? Is he not arrived yet? He comes in tomorrow. OK. Uh, Freedom from Religion Foundation was having a convention in Seattle a while back. And uh, I'm, I'm from Seattle originally, so I read the Seattle newspapers. And my, my family all tells me about these things, and especially now, my family, every time there's something about godlessness, they think they've got to let me know about what's going on. And I think they're trying to convince me that it's going to go away. Anyway, um, all the news, if you read the newspapers, every single story started out the same way. That here's this big convention coming to town. Oh, but they're, they're fighting with each other. They're very, they're very icky. They're, they're complaining with each other. In particular, they're upset because um, there's Richard Dawkins, who is your archetypical in-your-face atheist, right? 
like me, we're, we're proud to say we're atheists. We think you should be atheists too. We're all going to be arguing and, and in your face. And we think religion is stupid, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is Paul Kurtz, who's uh, more diplomatic about it all. And lately, he's been rather upset at the new atheists because he thinks the new atheists are just too abrasive. They're not, they're not going to make the, a dent in the culture because they're, they're too rude and obnoxious, which I disagree with, but it, no, he's a smart guy. So, you know, you got to listen to him carefully. So here are these two guys. They're fighting, and everyone's saying, well, this is signs of a deep rift in the atheist community. And I say, no, because I look at these two guys, and this is what I see. I see a couple of dung beetles, and it's just fine. This is, this is a, a dung beetle of the genus Anthophagus. Uh, these are very cool animals, and I'll tell you why, and it, and it is relevant. Um, <laughs> trust me, it may take a while to get there, but you'll see it's relevant. Uh, what's cool about these beetles is they have a very specific mating system where the males grow these gigantic horns. Okay, they've got this huge horn coming off of them. And, and they use them in mating battles. What they do is they corner a female who does not have a horn, and they convince her somehow that she is going to bear children for the male, and the male walls her off in a little burrow with a big, beautiful ball of dung, all of her own. And she's supposed to, and then every once in a while, the male goes into the tunnel and, and inseminates the female, and she goes about her business of laying eggs on, on the ball of dung. Well, the problem with being a dung beetle is that there are other male dung beetles who want to do the same thing. So this dung beetle spends most of his time just outside the burrow guarding it in case other males come along. And when another male comes along, they have these battles where they lock the horns and they, they push and pull at each other and they try to flip the other guy over. It's, it's spectacular wrestling matches. Really fun to watch. But anyway, they go in these big battles. And the bigger your horn, the more likely you are to topple the other guy and win the fight and get to keep your girl. So that's what they do. Now, there's something else interesting going on in this population, though. Look, data. Oh, it's complicated again. Well, a couple of things are going on here. First of all, when you look at the population, you discover that there's two different kinds of males. There are the great big horned males that do the, the battles, and then there are these other males that are small, don't have the horns, and what they do instead is they wait until the big horny male is distracted at the burrow in a battle, and then they quickly duck into the tunnel, and they woo the female. I think they tell them they're beautiful and all this kind of thing. Come away with me. and Boy, your, your ball of dung is beautifully maintained, and, and all these, you know, tell them poetry and stuff like that that the brute male usually doesn't. And they mate with them, and they, it's, it's a very successful way to, to propagate their genes. Uh, the big males are called consort males because they maintain a consort. They're, they're watching the burrows. Uh, the little males had a very good name that the scientists gave them, uh, but they couldn't get it published. They were called sneaky fuckers. <laughs> I know, it's a beautiful name. It tells you exactly what they're doing. Uh, so but when, you read, when you read the literature now, what you'll find is that they're called sneaker males. Not quite as punchy, but okay, it, it passes the censors. Now here's, here's the other cool thing about these. Uh, they can do experiments on these beetles, and what you do is you catch the beetles when they're, when they're pupae, and you can force them to go down one path or the other. Uh, what you can do is you go into the hot wire, red hot wire, and you, you cauterize the little piece of tissue that gives rise to the horn. So that's what's done in these experiments. You take this poor beetle when it's a pupa, you go in there and you fry its little spot where it's going to make horns and it makes no horn at all. Uh, and you think that's a terrible thing to do to the beetle. But it turns out they compensate beautifully because what happens is if you get your horn chopped off, you grow giant testicles, which is what's illustrated in this particular graph, that your testicle size go, goes ballooning upwards. Which I think is impressive. That's real developmental biology. They can also do the converse experiment. That is, you can, and this is even crueler. You go into these pupae, and you can take that same wire, and you burn out the little patch of tissue that gives rise to the gonads. So they make no testes. But when they pupate, they, they grow these enormous horns instead. 
You know this phenomenon. If you've been on the driveway and you see the, the big SUVs driving by, <laughs> there is a perfect inverse correlation, okay? So anyway, this, this is a, a really cool example of diverse strategies with biology adapting in different ways to support these different strategies. And both strategies work effectively in propagating the species. Uh, here's another example. Uh, I know it's kind of hard to see. The, these are cuttlefish. And they're doing sort of the same thing. Uh, and it's even harder for me to see from here. Look at the top panel, and there's a C there. That's a consort male. Okay, so that's a male cuttlefish. He's, he's facing off there to the left, with the, and he's rearing up his tentacles in a threat display. He's being very aggressive. And at the F is a female. The female is just this little brown drab thing that's sitting there, uh, very attractive to the male, of course, but she's, she's, not, she's not making a big move here. And what you see off at the top right is there's another male coming along. The cuttlefish don't make horns, instead what they put on these colorful threat displays and wave tentacles around and everything. So there's a male coming up from the top right down there, and the sea male is busy flaring his tentacles to scare him off. Down there in the bottom left, where it says M, that's another male. But what he's done is he's switched on the female coloration. So he's sneaking, okay? He's sneaking over there to the female. In the middle panel, what you see is top right is the consort male and this intruder male, and they're busy arguing and bickering and fighting with each other. And down there in the bottom left, that's the sneaker male and the female going at it. <laughs> the, the, when cuttlefish do it, they, you know, they come together with little waving tentacles and they do this, and they, they get very face-to-face -face and affectionate. That's what what's going on right there. So it's an effective strategy for them. The, the third panel is particularly interesting because what has happened here is that the Male at the top right there, he's given up, and he's switched on the female coloration, and he's moved in down there. And the original sneaker male is down there, the, so there's now two males, camouflage as females, both of them busily mating with a female, and the consort male happily watching on. <laughs> so it's kind of a foursome. And he doesn't even know that, 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 you know, it's like there's these two transvestite males, a female and, and the alpha male standing up there. This stuff gets really kinky. <laughs> and it gets even kinkier because it turns out one of the, one of the drawbacks of doing this is uh, you may think you're really clever acting as a sneaker male, dressing up as a female and going in and, and mating. Um, the camouflage is so good that sometimes Mr. C over there uh, will plant a nice hectocodal arm in your mantle and inseminate you. <laughs> so this is just a warning of the hazards of this sort of thing. Okay, but my point is this. Diverse strategies are wonderful. It's, it's how these species go at it. All, uh, the, the kink is high in the universe out there, and that's good. So. Uh, now here are these two guys, and, and I look at these, and like I say, dung beetles, cuttlefish, I don't care. Uh, this is what they are. <laughs> and, and I mean this in complete respect to both of them. These are viable strategies. So when we see this going on, when we see these, these people in our movement battling it out and arguing about how to do it, which way we should go, uh, this is not a sign that we're in crisis. This is a sign of strength. This is where we're exploring all these different avenues to get our message out there. And so, yeah, I, I, see, I see all these news stories about deep, deep rifts, and I just say, Great, more riffs. We just love those in this community because we are atheists. We don't have a dogma. We're all free to think for ourselves. So yeah, let's, let's carve out some more d deep riffs of our own. Okay, next one. That we're dying out. Uh, th this is a very peculiar argument. Uh, and and it's, it's cloaked in this biological jargon again. So in this case, I'm, I'm completely justified in talking about biology here. Uh, as if I wasn't in the last case. Okay. Anyway, uh, here's a couple of examples. Uh, 
one of my favorite people, sort of, Bill Donahue, uh, is up there. He's been ranting about this. Uh, he's, he's not so worried about the atheists because look at what we're doing. We're walking our dogs, going to bathhouses, and aborting our kids. Wow. So the population is plummeting. You, know, you, you don't have to worry about gay people. You don't have to worry about atheists. They're not going to reproduce. They're gonna, all going to go away. Uh, this is guy, another guy named Ed West. You've never heard of him. He's a, he's a columnist for the Telegraph. And he's also got this same thing where he starts throwing out data at us, uh, these, these numbers, uh, that when you look at uh, various rates of reproduction of different groups, you know, 0 0.85 children per atheist woman. Whoa. Are you worried? Uh, even though it's barren European countries, average rate is about 1.2 which you know, they're not really replacing there either. And since most people inherit their parents' political and religious worldviews, this is bad news for Team Dawkins. There is much to argue with in these particular stories. Uh, and, and I'm going to introduce you to a little biology and, and a little easy math. Don't panic. Uh, these, these are, this is a basic equation in population genetics, OK? This is Verhul's uh, equation of population dynamics. And what it's basically saying with, with that very simple formula is on the left, the rate of change of the size of the population, n, over time equals the reproduction rate, so how many babies are the individuals popping out per unit time, times the population size, times 1 minus population size divided by k, which is the carrying capacity. That is, how many, how many individuals can survive in this particular environment total? And when you plot these things out and you look at populations, what they tend to do is they tend to rise fairly rapidly, and then they plateau out when they reach the carrying capacity, because if you produce more babies than the, than the, than the environment can carry, they die. So it just goes up, flattens out. This is, it's kind of a simplistic model, but it's, it's, it's OK. Uh, the point is, I want to introduce you to those two terms, R and K. R and K are important values in population dynamics. So R is the reproductive rate, K is the carrying capacity. When those previous columnists were complaining about atheist reproduction rate, uh, they were only talking about one of the terms, that R. They're saying that R is really low, which is kind of true. But they don't talk about K. When you look at uh, biological populations, one of the things you can do is characterize them along a continuum. You can talk about R-selected and K-selected species. So R-selected species tend to be small, very fecund. They mature very rapidly. They have a short generation time. They thrive in extremely unstable environments because they can exploit new environments fairly rapidly. And they die at high rates. This is, this is not an entirely desirable sort of scheme to live in if you're a human being. K-selected species, on the other hand, uh, tend to be large animals. They tend to be long-lived. They tend to have fewer offspring. So the R tends to be smaller. They have a large parental investment. These are animal species who do not just simply kick the baby out once it's born and tell it to go fend for itself. They may keep it in the den for a while. They may feed it for a long time. They may, you know, in the nest, whatever, and take care of it for a good long time. Uh, they tend to be found in stable populations near the carrying capacity. Stability and certainty versus uncertainty, instability is basically the dilemma you're dealing with here. So what are some examples of R-selected species? There's a couple. Uh, this is Missouri. You guys don't have an ocean here, I hear. Uh, if you ever get to the ocean, I've seen this a few times. It's spectacular. Uh, you find echinoderms, things like sea urchins and sea stars and, and, and sand dollars and so forth. They live in these big shoals along the shore. And uh, what they do to avoid uh, excessive predation during periods of reproduction is they all coordinate and they reproduce at exactly the same time, which in the case of a sea urchin means spewing out clouds of sperm from the male and clouds of eggs from the female all at once. And it's beautiful to see because the ocean will just turn white with sperm and eggs everywhere. I don't recommend swimming if you, you know, it's feels kind of icky. Like, but anyway, they're, they're dumping all this stuff out there. And that's an example of arsenic where you're just spewing out 
tons and tons of babies that you're not going to care about once they're done. Sea urchins have zero parental investment, no reproductive care at all after they produce the egg. And of course, the classic example is the cockroach. Now, when those columnists are complaining about R being too low, what they're basically saying, what I hear them saying is, we should be more like cockroaches. That's our, that's our human destiny. You know, and what's that show? Uh, the show with the, the John and something. Well, John and, uh, yeah, John and Kate plus eight. Uh, I haven't been able to watch that because I think of marine invertebrates when I'm watching this show. That's, that's what their lifestyle is becoming. This is not desirable, not to us. We are not a, an our selected species. We are a K-selected species. We're like these big, majestic, beautiful animals, elephants and whales. <laughs> Classic K-selected species. This is the life we want to live, right? <laughs> so, you know, this argument that we're not reproducing fast enough, it, it's bogus. It's, it's because this is our chosen strategy. That what we ideally want to do is instead of having 15 kids, uh, we want to have maybe one or two kids and do a really good job raising them and get them off to a good college, get them off to a good start. That's our strategy, and I think it's a good one. Uh, the arguments against us, are, uh, the other place where we find these arguments, there's a couple of places. Um, one thing is that these same arguments were made at the turn of the century in favor of eugenics. That people were saying, well, the morons are reproducing faster than the Presbyterians, and we've got to do something about this. We've got to reinforce this. Uh, we've, we've got to correct against it. Uh, the interesting thing is that back then they were complaining about uh, how it was so terrible that the morons are reproducing at such a phenomenal rate and out, outgunning the, the wealthy, liberal, smart people. And nowadays things have reversed and the Christians are willingly putting themselves in the place of the morons in that particular argument, which is kind of revealing. But the other place where you hear a lot of it is with gay people. And they say, gay people are going to die out. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, so here's some numbers for you, some really interesting numbers. Uh, if you look at our population right now, 27% uh, of the same-sex households in America have children. 26% of the different-sex households have children. They're roughly comparable. When you talk to gay men, uh, about half of them want children. Talk to heterosexual men, and this is no surprise, 33% want children someday. And, and this isn't the creepy kind of want children. This is, you know, good, healthy, I want, I want to bring up children and raise them well and, and raise them in my values sort of way. Uh, the average same-sex sex, sex couple income is 25% higher than different sex couples. They tend to be more prosperous. And 30%, 34% of the same-sex couples have advanced degrees versus 13% in the population of different sex couples. There is something going on here. These are, these are people who are, again, following a different strategy, but a perfectly viable strategy. Uh, this last statistic is, is very interesting. Uh, if you survey the obituaries, which people have done, uh, you discover that 50% of the women in California are dying childless. And I know when you, when, you, when you hear that, you think, oh, that's so sad. Those, those women dying, you know, with the barren wombs and no little babies running around. And that's completely wrong. Uh, they, are, they are not dying childless because they were forced to. They are dying childless because they chose to live this life, that they wanted successful, productive lives as career women. Uh, they, they are perfectly satisfied with their position. Uh, they've also done surveys of the uh, life satisfaction of various people. And it's true that if you, if you look at married people with children, their lifetime satisfaction is pretty high. Uh, the highest lifetime satisfaction for people, though, turns out to be divorced women. 
So this seems to be sort of the ideal for women is, well, I got it over with, I discovered what it's all about, and boy, am I happy to be rid of him. <laughs> so, you know, these women are not dying miserably and alone. What they're doing is they're dying after a productive life, and they're probably looking back on their deathbed and, and thinking great thoughts about, well, I ran that nonprofit and did a great job helping children find homes, or boy, that was a great weekend in Bali with that Polynesian guy. And you know, <laughs> things like that are going through their heads, not misery. So this, this is something we've got to change our minds about a little bit, is what is our goal as human beings? It's to live a good, productive life and die happy, and that does not mean reproducing like cockroaches. Okay, uh, there was this, this comment that, uh, that Ed Westfellow made, and since most people inherit their parents' political and religious worldviews, this is bad news for Team Bob Dawkins, which I, I simply say, that's, that's total <laughs> bullshit. Uh, how many of you atheists here come from religious families? <laughs> oh, me too, yeah. See what I mean? Uh, th th that's just bogus, of course. Uh, this is the way most atheists are forming now, is we are persuading them. We are recruiting them to our degenerate, corrupt lifestyle. <laughs> well, actually, it's a pretty good lifestyle, isn't it? A life of reason is always good to live for. So th this is just totally bogus, not something we really have to worry about. Okay, one last one. How am I doing for time? Have I bored you all to tears? Yeah, well, okay. Uh, this is another claim that you hear all the time, uh, that religion is a human universal, and one of the big proponents of this is, is somebody who irritates me endlessly, uh, Karen Armstrong. Karen Armstrong is the, one of this new generation of fluffy, airy, nebulous theists who argues religion for religion's sake, doesn't worry too much about which specific sect you're in, uh, isn't even concerned that existence is nece a necessary quality of a god. Okay, you can believe in a god who is so all-powerful that he doesn't even exist. <laughs> and obviously, if you've got a god who doesn't exist and yet he created the world, he's much more powerful than the god that does exist and created the world. He's operating on a handicap, right? Anyway, uh, so she's, she's, again, it's a wall of text. Don't worry about all the text. Uh, but it's, it's just her arguing, well, that what, we've, that, that what the atheists are doing is, is they're denying their human nature, that this, this, this galls me when they say things like this. Uh, homo sapiens is also homo religiosus. No, he's not. I mean, look at you guys. Uh, there, there's this whole crowd of people here, including me. Uh, we're not religious. Uh, again, are we, are we being excluded from the human race here? Uh, this, this is, again, complete nonsense. We, this is just not the way it works. And then, of course, the, the goes on to argue that God isn't going anywhere. And I think among all of us atheists here, we'd agree, yeah, God has gone somewhere. He's gone to the great garbage bin in the sky. We're getting rid of God. So, yeah, he's going away. Uh, here's another one. This one just came out last Sunday, and I've been meaning to write it up on the blog just because it is so amazingly wrong. Uh, this is Nicholas Wade. He's a science columnist for the New York Times. And, and it's, it's amazing because not only is he letting his religious biases show through here, but he's getting evolutionary biology all wrong. Uh, what does he say here? He says, uh, well, this is in reference to some, he was, he's describing some research that was done in the Middle East where they're, I think it was Middle East, where they're excavating these, these sites and discovering uh, temples and so forth, and they're old temples. And uh, Therefore, uh, what this says is it's pointing the way to a new perspective. There's nothing new in what he says here uh, that seeks to explain why religions, religious behavior has occurred in societies at every stage of the development of the world and so forth. Uh, he says here, Religion has the hallmarks of an evolved behavior, meaning that it exists because it was favored by natural selection. Are there any biologists here? No. I mean, I'm the only one that's puking at this. This is not true. This is completely wrong. Uh, 
that it is not that, that what we have here is a behavior. Uh, it's not yet determined whether it's purely cultural and kind of soft or whether it's evolved and actually has a biological component. So that's up in the air. We don't know that for sure. And the other thing, of course, is that that is not the proper definition. It, if you've got an evolved behavior, it is not necessarily because it was selected for. Th this is what we call the pan-adaptationist view. Uh, it's, it's pretty false, all right? It's just not right. Uh, so here he is making this completely fallacious argument for here. And he's saying, here, it is universal because it was wired into our neural circuitry. This is a fallacy called begging the question, okay? He has not shown any evidence that religion is wired into our neural circuitry. There is no such evidence. There are millions of satisfied atheists out there who do not practice religion and do not feel a deficit. So this, this is completely false. And he goes on to say, for atheists, it's not a particularly welcome thought that religion evolved because it conferred essential benefits on early human societies and their successors. If religion is a life belt, it's hard to portray it as useless, or portray it as useless. Uh, again, multiple errors here. Uh, for one thing, if you talk to the scientists who study the evolution of religion, uh, this is a pretty, fairly common view that religion has had some selective benefit to the societies that have it. That's why it's all over the place, is it promotes things like tribal cohesion and so forth, it helps with organization. Uh, it may motivate people to do horrible things like go to war with their neighbors, which may in some cases be beneficial. So there are people who argue that it does have benefits, so we're not at all deterred by this. Uh, you can also look at people like Richard Dawkins, who's kind of the arch atheist, the in-your-face atheist I pointed out earlier, and he has actually made this argument that religion does seem to confer some benefits, that it seems to be in particular a side effect of some benef beneficial traits of the human mind. So this is just lie, 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 lie. Uh, if religion is a life blade, it's hard to portray as useless. No, I can portray anything as useless. It's pretty easy to do. You know, because, you know, for instance, if, if evolution evolved as a helpful aid in the society, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a helpful aid now. And it's pretty easy, as JT has just done a little bit ago, argue that it's getting in the way of getting things done in society now. Okay, I'll just close here. Uh, one thing I want, to, and this, this is on a fairly positive note, that there are all these people that are saying that we're doomed, that atheism is going to go away, and their arguments are false. Is there good reason, though, to think that atheists, atheism will continue to boom, that we're going to grow of atheism? It's not taking Richard Carrier's books and forcing them on them, although you can do that. That's okay, right? <laughs> Perfectly acceptable. Uh, what seems to be more important, as, as Gregory Paul and Phil Zuckerman say here, is that atheism flourishes when society is stable, when you've got the luxury of being educated, when you can be fairly confident that the future is good, that you don't have that kind of uncertainty that might force you to get down on your knees and beg God for help because everything's falling apart. What we really have to do as atheists to spread the good word of atheism, and uh, Harris would, would agree with me on this, is that what we have to do as work as human beings, as members of our society, to promote all those good values in addition to not going to church, and that's what's eventually going to bring more and more people over to our side. Okay, I'll stop there and answer any questions until we get hauled out of here. <laughs>